October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first satellite, and the space race was on. After jettisoning the nose fairing and last stage of the carrier rocket, the Sputnik started circling the Earth. A Sputnik was only the size of a volleyball and you could not see that with a naked eye. But what you did see very vividly was the booster rocket that put that satellite into orbit. And at 4 a.m. I can walk down on my back porch with my daughter in my arms and much to my utter amazement, that satellite came virtually over my house. In the early 60s, there were the two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the U.S. There was a lot of anxiety or uncertainty, and the feeling at that time was that this was somehow a judgment of which was the better system. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. When Kennedy started the program for the first two years, we didn't know how we'd land on the moon. I was younger, I was a, a beginner to them, and they said, let's do it. We all had the confidence that we were just going to do it. It was never really a question of failing. In 1961, JFK began a dramatic expansion of the U.S. space program, partly in response to the Russians and Sputnik, and partly to inspire a nation to achieve greatness. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Kennedy's enthusiasm was joined by an elite team who shared his vision. Werner von Braun was a German aerospace engineer known as the father of rocket science. Bob Siemens at NASA had the vision to bring the right team together. And Dr. Charles Stark Draper, who had pioneered inertial guidance. The Apollo program was born. 12, 11, 10, Nine, ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Four forward, drift into the right a little. As Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepared to go to the moon, they knew this mission was made possible by thousands of engineers, scientists, and technicians. At the height of the Apollo program, there were over 400,000 engineers, technicians, and scientists working around the country and around the clock to develop and invent all the new technology required to make a moon landing possible. Among the unsung heroes of Apollo are the engineers from Draper, formerly the MIT Instrumentation Lab. They designed the onboard computers and invented the software that made it technically possible to send men to the moon and bring the crew safely back to Earth. Eagle, Houston, we, Houston, we see you on the stairwell, over. Roger, how does it look? Eagle has wings. Roger. Landing 3,000 feet. You're looking great. The lab's founder, Charles Stark Draper, went to great lengths to figure out how to guide a spacecraft to the moon. Draper, known as a navigational pioneer, had just proven his new inertial guidance technology for the military. He was now looking to space. It all started in World War II under fire control, which is what Doc Draper originally started in the instrumentation world, and from that was spawned the inertial navigation concept and systems. Everyone talks about Doc. He was a legend at the lab. The culture was kind of fluid, and you know, we were pretty free to, you know, work what hours were comfortable for us. Having that fluidity allowed us to be more productive, I think. Doc used to come down to almost every part of the laboratory. He was involved in talking to each individual. He'd come down with his little green visor, and if there was an important job in the lathe, he'd go over, look over the man's shoulder, 
comment, ask how it was going. The 1960s marked a giant leap in technology firsts. This was the Apollo decade, and it would take a series of firsts to get man to the moon. NASA was inventing the whole mission. Everything was new, and these actual animations from the time helped to explain this whole new concept of lunar orbit rendezvous. The computer was at the top of the list. A computer to provide guidance, navigation, and control. Without these three words, Neil Armstrong and the Apollo 11 crew would never have made it to the moon. Draper's probably most famous for the development of advanced guidance, navigation, and control systems, or as we shorten it down to GNC. Uh, navigation is something that, that tells you where you are, uh, and uh, guidance tells you where you want to go. Uh, control uh, enables you to get there. It was actually a critical uh, key element for us getting the Apollo contract. The job of designing the guidance system to take man to the moon was awarded to Draper. This was the very first Apollo contract, and the good news came via telegraph. This computer had to be able to withstand the rigors of spaceflight, including extreme temperatures and intense vibrations. It had to be perfect because human lives were at stake. Computer engineer Hal Lanning invented the code that was an easy-to-use new language for entering complex math equations into a computer. With so little available memory for the Apollo computer and so many commands, it was Lanning's genius idea to create a priority system. The computer would prioritize and run the most important commands first. The less important jobs could run in the background. Lanning's unique computer language, ironically called Mac or machine-aided cognition, turned the moon landing concept into reality. There was a Mac language that was developed here at the laboratory, an ex exquisite engineering language. It was, it was critical that both the command module and the LEM be able to compute solutions for maneuvers. We wanted to make sure that either the command module could get the LEM or the LEM could get back to the command module. It was a breakthrough in all of computing for what was going on, both the hardware and the software. People today can't believe it. It was all done with punch cards and key punches. Most kids today don't know what a punch card looked like. You program it, you went in and punched it on a key punch, and put a batch of cards and ran it through a card reader into those big IBM computers. So you had to make sure they were done right, no little errors, no cards out of order, and so on. The result was the Apollo Guidance Computer, the first portable computer that guided man to the moon. The Apollo Guidance Computer was no more powerful than a calculator, but used a real-time operating system to control the spacecraft. The Apollo Guidance Computer, at that day, it was replacing banks of computers that filled the whole room. The Guidance Computer was really an advance and the only way to get the, the weight and the size down was to go to integrated circuits. That's something that hadn't been done before. You could not build a computer out of transistors to do the job that was needed to be done without filling up the whole command module. The integrated circuits were the way to go. You know, one time we were testing one third of all the integrated circuits that were being manufactured in the United States. We were pretty closely linked to the real beginning of computing. The heart of the Apollo guidance system was the IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit. The IMU was a three-gimbaled system containing three gyroscopes and three accelerometers. And the purpose of it was to provide a stabilized platform with uh, accelerometers that would measure the acceleration, and be used in the guidance equations. Data was fed to the guidance computer so that the crew could control and navigate the spacecraft. The system was so precise that no matter what the position of the spacecraft was hurtling through space, the orientation was always stable. While primary navigation of the spacecraft would be done from the ground, an onboard inertial navigation system with a sextant was developed for the crews. Operating independently from all other navigational systems, the sextant consists of two lines of sight, a wide-angle scanning telescope and a 28-power narrow field of view space sextant. 
This made it possible for the astronauts to check their navigation settings and stay on course. The IMU was packaged in a spherical case, a ball of wizardry and magic conceived by Doc Draper. For the first time ever, pilots would fly a craft with all digital controls. The software that we developed to control these vehicles, the command module, the lunar module, and the combinations of those things, that had never been done with the digital computer up to that point in time. Simulators tested the software end to end. It's an enormous amount of testing to do because at that point you were testing a complete sequence, say, you know, from the lunar orbit, the descent to landing on the moon. We had simulated the dickens out of that thing. The Apollo spacecraft would travel to the moon with revolutionary technology the first ever digital flight control system, known as digital fly-by-wire. Fly-by-wire is how we got to the moon and back. There was no manual stick. You had to let the computer do all the process for you. The computer controlled the hydraulics and controlled jets that you turned on to rotate, turned on engines. It was all very uh, cutting edge. As the Apollo 11 team are just months away from a moon landing, we are reminded of the man who set the challenge and who would sadly not be present for the historic moment. This remarkable footage shows JFK's last visit to Cape Canaveral in 1963, just one week shy of his assassination. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. He would never see man walk on the moon, but the team of visionaries he assembled risked all to fulfill his dream. July 16, 1969. With over a half billion people around the world watching, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin are set to leave Earth, and for the first time in history, set down on another planetary body. The defining moment of the Apollo program was the moon landing, yet it almost didn't happen. Apollo 11 was our first attempt at landing on the moon. The guidance and navigation system was probably one of the most complex subsystems the flight crews had to work with. One evening, after a long day's work, I came out of my office and walked outside, and there in the sky above me was the real full moon itself. It just kind of overwhelmed me to think uh, that's where we're going, and uh, I have a part in it. Ignition sequence starts. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. There it is. The Earth. Yeah? Yeah. Get up on after a two-day journey to the moon, the crew of three are captured into lunar orbit. During this critical phase, called Translunar Injection, or TLI, the crew loses communication with mission control. During the blackout, mission control awaits anxiously as the spacecraft makes its critical burns to get into the exact trajectory necessary for a successful lunar landing. Armstrong and Aldrin move to the lunar module and prepare for separation from the mothership and their descent to the lunar surface. Two minutes, 53 seconds from reacquiring the spacecraft. Collins will remain solo in lunar orbit, awaiting their return. Leaving the moon and going back to lunar orbit is actually a relatively easy maneuver. Um, it didn't place really great demands on the guidance computer. But the lunar landing did. It was by far the busiest phase of the mission for either spacecraft. 
The lunar landscape is comprised mostly of craters and rocks. Picking the spot where man would land required a great deal of calculation. Risks varied from landing on a boulder and tipping over, to sinking into a soft crater and disappearing forever into a dust cloud. With the help of lunar scientists and images from a lunar surveyor sent just before the Apollo missions, NASA selected several suitable sites with minimal boulders and craters. The Lunar Orbiter mission took a lot of photography of the lunar surface that was valuable to the uh, Apollo planning. Not only photography, but it began to define the gravitational field around the moon, which was also very important to guidance and navigation. It was critical that the guidance and navigation could determine the position and flight path of the lunar lander before descent to the surface. On Apollo 11, the landing was divided into three phases. There was the braking phase, uh, the visibility phase, and then there was the semi-manual landing phase. This is Apollo Control. Armstrong and uh, Aldrin uh, began checking out, activating the lunar module. Uh, both spacecraft looking very good at this time. Uh, during the braking phase, uh, one of the main tasks was to get the landing radar locked onto the surface. After the radar had locked on, Buzz Aldrin keyed in a special display in order to watch the landing radar data. Houston, you're looking at our Delta uh, That's permanent. And as soon as he did that... 1202. The alarm light lit up, and we heard from the spacecraft program alarm. Program alarm. Bravo 2. Hit. Incorporate. Apollo 11, this is Houston. How do you read? It was a 1202 alarm, which was an alarm we never expected to see in flight. It was an emergency. It was scary. I can still remember looking across the room at a couple of the guys saying, oh my God, 1202, what's going on? A problem with the rendezvous radar electronics is stealing precious computer time. Aldrin's special display tips the computer into overload. Columbia, Houston, over. 1202 alarm is the statement that says, we ran out of space and we're taking care of it. Columbia, Houston, we're standing by. There was a priority system set up in the Apollo guidance computer so that priority tasks could interrupt tasks with less priority. If we had waited a second to do the next control calculation, it would have gone unstable. The priority display said, I'm more important than any of you. So it interrupts everything that's been set up to go. The Apollo guidance computer was trying to process too many computer commands at once during the landing sequence. The exhausted computer sounded its 1202 alarm, signaling an overload. If you're talking about the landing, there's nothing you can do. Uh, you can't complete the landing, so you, your only option now is to go back to the command module. NASA's Jack Garman had a cheat sheet and was confident the computer could be trusted. Margaret Hamilton and a team of software engineers had programmed the computer for such a scenario. So through the whole period of that alarm, the spacecraft was still under control. Had it been capable of stealing the cycles, it would have been a disaster. The computer worked exactly as it was designed. It was um, a combination of the hardware, the software, an amazing system of systems operating system that was designed by Hal Lanning really was a blessing to that because and when it got to overload situation it just did the important jobs and landed. Attitude control is good. Manual attitude control is good. The ruling was that the landing could continue unless there were further signs of problems and therefore the call was a go. Roger, thank you for landing. Years of preparation and testing paved the way for the historic landing. In the final seconds of the descent, flying faster than anticipated, Armstrong and Aldrin overshoot their intended landing site. They are heading for a hazardous rocky area 
and manually fly the lunar module to a safe landing spot with just seconds of fuel to spare. The alarm strong in this case was the pilot is flying the vehicle manually and he was picking out a spot to try to hover over and then descend to land. He had to find a spot that wasn't so rocky. Pretty rocky area. The worst of all worlds would be to tip it over. They did, in fact, come within about 30 seconds of running out of fuel, which would be very dangerous if you're close to the moon. And then Buzz Aldrin said, 30 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. And at that point, I knew this was different. OK, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The Apollo program, to me, uh, was the most exciting. Uh, a lot of the other things we've done with the shuttle, for instance, have been technically very challenging, but it didn't have the backdrop of landing on the moon. It's almost hard to believe that we were doing all of those things. The Saturn V worked every time we asked it to, and the computer system worked every time we asked it to. Uh, it just was a remarkable period of time. The amount of memory that was on the Apollo guidance computer is a couple of orders of magnitude less than what you carry around as the smartphone in your pocket. That's absolutely mind-blowing. It is kind of miraculous to me that we actually did it. Doc's attitude is what brought the best out of these groups of people. He liked to say that his lab builds things that work. And it sounds so fundamental, uh, but it actually is, is very uh, key to why Vapor's been successful. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's a very good legacy to leave behind. I can't presume to predict what the future is going to hold, but I'm sure it's going to be different from anything we imagined. The human race is certainly going to go out into the stars. I thank you very much. <laughs>